So for the first panel, I guess what I, what I want to do is, is introduce the, uh, the moderator for the first panel, which is Deborah Blum. And uh, she's the author of uh, Poisoner's Handbook, The Murder and Birth of Modern Forensics, Medicine in the Jazz Age, New York. She's also a uh, winner of 1992 Pulitzer for a series in the Sacramento Bee entitled The Monkey Wars, which analyzed the battle over using animals in biomedical research, another example of the kind of fraying of the social uh, contract between society and, and science. And now she's a professor of journalism and mass communication uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I'm going to turn things over to uh, Deborah, who will introduce her speakers. And, uh, and she will get the conversation going and ultimately engage all of us as well. Ah, I'm also instructed to say, if you have an open seat next to you, could you please indicate so by raising your hand? And of equal importance, more lunch is on the way, but you're not permitted to go get it. So. <laughs> As you can see, we're setting this up in a fairly conversational way. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce our two panelists, and ask them a couple of questions to get them started, and then we're hoping this will be an inclusive conversation and that you will join in and ask them questions as well. Um, uh, to my far left is Stephen Trachtenberg, who was the 15th president of George Washington University from 1988 to 2007, where he still holds an endowed chair in public service. He's a graduate of both Yale and Harvard, received 16 honorary degrees in honor of his service to higher education, and he's written numerous books on the subject. Uh, sitting next to me is Andy Revkin. Andy is a longtime environmental writer for the New York Times, uh, and still maintains a blog there, Dot Earth. He's a senior fellow at the Pace Academy for Applied Environmental Studies. Uh, he's the author of numerous other publications, including the 2009 book, The North Pole Was Here, Puzzles and Perils at the Top of the World. And he primarily, if you know Andy, focuses on issues related to climate change, but opens those up in other ways. We had a third panelist, and you'll see him in your program, who is not here. George Post, uh, speaking of climate change, he's back in Arizona fighting an outbreak of wildfires near his house. Um, but we will uh, try, that will allow us to have more time for our other brilliant panelists here. I'm going to start with uh, Stephen Trachtenberg in this sense, uh, partly because at this moment, higher education is such an exceptionally easy punching bag. Uh, and, and I note that James Pearson wrote recently in the New Criterion that it used to be that only conservatives <laughs> criticized higher education. But now he says everyone is unhappy. And as an example, he cites some of the uh, points raised in a recent book by Andrew Hacker and Claudia Dreyfus um, on higher education in which they say a huge and vital sector of our society has become a colossus taking on many roles and doing none of them well. As we watch governments retreat from funding higher education, California being a prime example, one question worth asking is whether the dysfunctional operation of universities has actually led to a loss of public support in this enterprise, including the research enterprise. In other words, is the way we run universities the problem? Professor Trachtenberg. <laughs> As you'd expect. The answer is yes and no. Um, it was Albert Einstein, who uh, I think is going to be quoted by everybody you hear today, uh, who said that uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, uh, but expecting different uh, results. And uh, therein lies one of the great problems we've got with the contemporary university, is that its uh, medieval roots um, have inspired us to do the same thing over and over again. And, uh, and we've been successful uh, at doing it for so long uh, that um, 
we cannot imagine doing it in any other way, even uh, to propose modest change uh, is, uh, as a university administrator, is to invite the, uh, the uh, uh, disapproval of one's, uh, of one's faculty. The faculty are always in favor of progress, but change is a word that is eschewed. <coughs> I saw a cartoon the other day in the, uh, in the New Yorker that I thought was perfect, and I, and I will describe it to you because I didn't have the sense to make a slide. And it showed two medieval-looking people <coughs> uh, looking at a, at a book. And one said to the other, well, it seems like an interesting idea, but it'll never replace the scroll. <coughs> and and um, it occurred to me that um, the book, of course, is uh, what should have replaced the lecture. Uh, when, uh, uh, when the lecture uh, was first used in the university, it, 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 uh, it was because uh, the faculty member uh, had a, a, sit, a set of knowledge uh, that needed to be transmitted to, uh, uh, to the students. The students sat as you were sitting, the, the professor sat at the front of the room or stood and, and spoke, and they took notes. And at the end of the year, uh, the book had been transmitted uh, to, the, to the students. They went away with the book. After the invention of, of uh, movable type uh, and, and the book, uh, uh, you would have thought that, uh, that the lecture would have been mitigated, that uh, uh, people would have increasingly simply turned to volumes rather than to lectures. And, and, and little by little, there is some of that, of course. Uh, but the books were expensive, and it took a long time. And, uh, and uh, so here we are in the 21st century, and, uh, and continuing on universities all over this campus, to put up buildings in which we put lecture halls on a regular basis, even as concurrently uh, we are seeing more and more distance learning and, uh, and uh, 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 less and less use of, uh, of classrooms in the conventional way. Uh, lectures, as you know, are the, are the least effective way of transmitting knowledge. People retain information that they have read uh, far better than what, they, than what they have heard. So you would think that it would have changed, but no. As a university president, I, I um, uh, every now and again uh, decided I would, uh, I, uh, I would risk my career by, by uh, proposing to the faculty senate that we do something new. Uh, for example, uh, I thought about the calendar I got each year at Christmas from, from the garage, and it had, it had 12 months in it. And the one I got from the university uh, seemed to be missing May, June, July, and August. <laughs> and, and so I, I went to the faculty and said, look, you know, we could run these places far more efficiently if we, uh, if we maximized uh, the utility of our physical plant. Uh, and we ran classes 12 months a year, and we ran uh, uh, research 12 months a year. And, uh, and we had three semesters. Uh, um, and students could come in, and they could go through the university much more quickly. And, uh, and, um, and everybody laughed at me, and, uh, and, uh, and then actually got nasty. And so I. I uh, I, I, put it, I put it aside and came up a following year with a more modest proposal. I said, look, you know, a lot of people work five days a week, six even, and, um, and it occurs to me that we seem to close down on Thursday nights, and it's the night when all the students have their parties. And it might be a good idea if we were to run classes all day Fridays and maybe half a day on Saturday, the way it was when I was an undergraduate back in the dark ages. And, um, and everybody laughed at me again, and, uh, and I got nowhere with that idea. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, I, I discovered that, that changing universities was uh, perhaps uh, even more daunting than getting a building put up in the District of Columbia, which turns out to be extraordinarily daunting if you've ever tried it. Uh, getting zoning permits and things of this sort in Washington is an uh, Olympian uh, challenge. Uh, I, am, I am concerned that uh, while the conventional universities are going about business as usual, the for-profit institutions have, in fact, uh, seized the future. And one need not uh, um, uh, 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 be willing to accept their excesses without recognizing at the same time uh, their uh, successes. And Phoenix and, uh, and the other for-profit institutions are, in fact, successful only partly because they have been exploiting uh, the federal government and its uh, financial aid programs. They are also successful because they are delivering a service to students uh, that um, those students find helpful. Not every student, in fact, can come to a place at a certain time. Not every student can afford the price of uh, a university. Many people are homebound. Many people are traveling. Many people have jobs, children. 
and nevertheless want to, uh, want to learn. And that will, only, uh, that will only increase. We have democratized education and the need for education in such a way that uh, it cannot be uh, retained as the elite uh, uh, institution it was in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Indeed, uh, the balance of this century between uh, uh, elementary and secondary education as well as secondary education and postgraduate education is increasingly seeing the commodization of degrees uh, and, uh, and the need for uh, credentials and, uh, and the need for uh, continuing education, whether one is a lawyer or a physician. Is that a stop? Almost. Okay. Um, in any case, what I am arguing is that Peter Drucker may have gone too far in saying that the place-based university will become an artifact in the next decade or so, uh, but uh, he has not completely uh, uh, gone wrong. I want to follow up on the subject of education and and put a question to Andy Revkin in this context. And, and it's not so much uh, whether it's a public or private or, not, or for profit university, but I, I want to pull it back to the way we teach science just for a minute in this sense. Uh, a, a long time ago, one of the vice presidents at Caltech said to me that the K-12 system of teaching science is really a filtration of the priesthood. And K-12, what we do is we train those who are fit to become scientists, and in that same system, we cast off everyone else. And so that by the time they get to college, the most of them are not part of the conversation about science to begin with. And I'm concerned that we continue to do that at the college level as well. But I want to bring this back to Andy because he deals some with K-12 on Dot Earth. And because I think it's an interesting to look, thing to look at in the aspect of climate change. That is, we have a lot of scientists and a strong consensus at one level on global climate change and a kind of mixed reception, I'm going to say modestly, uh, with the public. And we have to ask ourselves, where does that mixed reception begin? And is the failure in part the way we teach science itself and whether or not we're bringing everyone into that conversation, Andy? Oh boy, there's a lot to chew on here, yes. including what Dan was raising some really important points and, and um, the questions about ac academia. Now, I moved from journalism to academia because I thought I'd become more effective. <laughs> Little did I know <laughs> that it's the same issues. Um, but there are also great opportunities. I think clearly the system we have now is not for the average citizen. And this is journalism as well as the way we're, we learn in schools. Um, we're not absorbing what science is, which is process, and, and that science implicitly is about argument. And if, if, you, if I could just convey one thing to the average person coming to my blog at the New York Times or to a student at Pace University, it, it's to get across the idea that argument is normal. Argument is how science proceeds. It's like a pool of piranhas or an acid bath and whatever is left over after everybody bites and chews is, what, is the new sense of what the world is like. And so, because what happens is when you don't have that awareness, then people go out into the world and see, oh, scientists are arguing, and by the way, nature is still complicated, and they kind of fuzz out because they're not uh, understanding and really engaging with the reality that it's a journey. And that you, there's robust knowledge about basics, but that the contention around the pace of sea level rise, around how warm it's going to get from a double amount of CO2, those are highly un uncertain questions still. But then you could at least normalize your sense that that's actually part of the picture that we understand. And then there's all the behavioral science that, that, that the physical, you know, I spent 20, almost 25 years writing about the biogeophysical problem of climate change. And, and it's just the last seven or eight years, paying more attention to the Dan Sarowitzes of the world, that I really realized how much of this problem is here. That, that um, critical thinking about science is not just having the ability to go on Google and understand what's a real important advance and what's just someone yelling. It's also, the critical thinking has to involve thinking about your own reaction to information and realizing that that's a powerful filter and that, that that's get, getting in the way of cogent discourse with other people. So, so making sure that behavioral sciences are a big part of what people learn as part of their basic um, understanding of this, this, these questions from an early age is, I think, vital, important, Do and possible. And possible, which yeah. is the most important part here. Do you agree? Yes, I do. I, I, and I think, uh, again, part of it has to do with the uh, um, problem we have is starting at the very earliest grades in which youngsters, particularly young women, are frightened away from mathematics and frightened away from 
STEM uh, uh, subjects. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and then it, it, it serves as sort of a gatekeeper. Um, everybody here would be a physician if they could have only gotten through organic chemistry. <laughs> But that's, that's, that's why I'm not a physician. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it was Specifically, I remember the course. I, I, never hear, I never hear physicians talking about how much they use organic chemistry <laughs> after they become doctors. But, mm -hmm. but to get into medical school uh, in the old days, that was, that was, the, that was the key. Yep. And still is. It's still a gatekeeper kind of course. So if you look at the slow change of universities, that would be a classic example yeah. of that. Are universities uh, distilling a... Uh, what do I want? A, a set of value in research and development. And, and what made me think of this is there was a New York Times story this week, uh, Hewlett Packard is planning to cut 30,000 jobs. And it talked about, the, uh, not this particular, Meg Whitman is the current CEO, but it was talking about uh, an earlier one, Mark Hurd, and made the point that as part of his necessary cost cutting, he cut R&D at Hewlett Packard, which had long time been a, an international leader, to such a degree that their, their scientists were using pirated software to run the equipment in their laboratory. And when I looked at that, first I, you know, I did one of those kind of, oh, I can't believe that. But then I thought, well, OK, but here's someone who's highly educated, goes into running a major company and has not had instilled with him a value and respect for R&D. And I wonder if, again, do we blame that on universities as well? Are we not teaching us to think in the ways we used to about investing in innovation? I don't think it's a sufficient database to, to come to that conclusion. Um, you know, I, I remember everybody blaming the law schools for Nixon. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And with good reason. And, and, and the business schools for what, you know, for two, losing $2 billion, uh, even though you're the leading investment banking uh, company in the world. Um, people make stupid decisions in all, in all uh, lo areas of, of, uh, of life. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think it's a cause and effect, I, I, I think. Um, after all, an awful lot of what we did accomplish is the result of what went on in the colleges and universities. And uh, I think human beings are flawed, and they're going to make bad decisions at times. Well, and also, you know, it's the quarterly report. Doing right. long, long throw, high failure rate research in a world of profits that have to be there for the next quarter is just not tenable. So we've taught that better. Yeah, taught which? We've taught the yeah. quarterly report better. Well, that's right. And then this gets at some work that some people in DC have written about with the, the. Um, you know, who's on campus recruiting, the, the MBA pipeline is very much more present, pre apt to c capture the really smart minds than, than science these days. I think that's true. Where do you see universities investing now in research then more? Uh, do you see a shift? I mean, in, in the sense of I would change universities if I didn't have the drag of the institution. Are they investing in, where would you change them? And, I, and I'd be interested to hear you say that, uh, deal with that too, Andy, if you could. Sure. Well, I think, I think it's important to take a look at, at, at what universities are doing. And they're doing two, obviously many things, but two conspicuous things are the teaching and the, and the, uh, and the research. And uh, um, I think on the teaching, on the teaching side, uh, uh, we're going to ha have, see more accountability. People are, the books, if you cited, for example, Hacker's book. Uh, really uh, focuses on the undergraduate experience and essentially says we're not adding value to young people after they come out of high school and go through to the BA. The second side, which is the, is the, uh, is the research side, uh, it, it is another matter altogether. The universities, whether they are the great California universities uh, uh, or, the, uh, or the independent universities, are increasingly concerned about, uh, about uh, funding right. and their ability to continue. Now, um, the truth of it is that, that funding has remained fairly consistent over the past uh, decade. So I think part of the problem is, uh, is a, perception, a perception issue. Because if somebody is going to invest in putting up a building, uh, they're going to spend millions of dollars, they're going to take 30-year commitments, and they're uncertain about the future. And it is, it is that uncertainty factor, I think, which is impacting on the commitment of institutions to, to doing research. Secondly, it's the issue uh, uh, of jobs and the fact that an awful lot of our graduate students in the sciences are coming from abroad and then going back, back home uh, to China and India, which are increasingly building their own infrastructure and which are going to become increasingly competitive both in the academic 
world and in the, uh, in the commercial and uh, industrial world. And so these are, these are obvious issues that are driving the universities. My own institution is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into a new science facility, and it's a, a colossal gamble by my successor uh, on uh, uh, the ability of GW to become an a, even better uh, science-based research university. And he comes out of, a, out of a culture informed by 10 years as provost of Johns Hopkins. Um, I myself, in his place, might have taken the institution further into the social sciences that we talked about, uh, because it seems to me a sure bet for less money located in the District of Columbia. And I'd like to come back to that, uh, Andy. Um, the, I get around to a lot of campuses these days for, for a variety of reasons. Actually, George Washington has, the, the rich things that I see, the, the, the reason campuses will persist is as a demonstration test bed for, and also to build demonstrations that their communities can understand, but also as a collaboratorium where students from dis different disciplines can find each other, do stuff, like at Planet Forward, I think is a very good example from George Washington, Rensselaer Polytechnic has an inventor's lab, and there's a course there that I wrote about in Dot Earth that's produced a bunch of startups where, and that's very tied into the community around it. So the campus is a hub that's t helping local businesses uh, grow and find ways forward that are sustainable. Uh, at Pace University, again, we're doing collaborative work where um, from the sciences and, and the communication, we've created vid films, documentaries that mainstream media aren't gonna do anymore that, about, um, sustainability issues, because we're, we're, we're doing the pieces that are sort of the good news, which the media don't tend to focus on very much. So, so there's lots of potential to make campuses into the, the sort of hub, place for people to relate to each other and, and work collaboratively. And then, and then you've got to build your, your virtual campus. At recent meetings at Pace, again, you know, there's a lot of focus on um, the physical campus, but I say we got to focus more on the virtual campus because that's where you're going to have these tie-ins to other institutions and, and have a public face. And again, if you want yeah. science to have meaning, it better be out of the ivory tower and, and in the face of the public as well. well we point. see two interesting things going on. We see on the one hand, MIT and Harvard committing $60 million to develop distance learning and to, and to democratize the university and allow people to take courses for free. And on the other hand, you see Cornell uh, a university and what is it, Hebrew University, uh, with the aid of Mayor Bloomberg, making billion dollar commitments to build physical campuses to do science research in, uh, in New York City. Uh, so the tension between the distance and the uh, place-based, I think, is going to be uh, increasingly uh, uh, obvious, and both are gonna cost great deals of, uh, of money. This is true. And Did then where's the business model, right? <laughs> when you're giving away your... You're well, nobody's figured that one out yet. No, I know. Yeah. I, but that hasn't stopped other people from jumping in. No, so no, Stanford said, wait, wait, me too. Right. <clears throat> no, I think we're doing more of that. I, I mean, going back to your point about the humanities, though, because science has to exist in a context. And one of the things that we see universities doing, and certainly my own, is uh, putting much money into what I'm going to call the hard sciences, the physical sciences, biological sciences, the med school, and shrinking the humanities component down to less and less and less because they don't see it as income producing for one thing. And so you see American universities sort of torquing their investment. You don't hear anyone talking about a billion dollar investment in an English history building, That's right? right. So do we limit the discussion to a select through? Again, going back to my question about the priesthood, do we find ourselves investing only in the select few who, who are able to get into those buildings and study in those buildings and disconnecting the sort of the larger social discussion? Well, I think you have to ask science for what. And, uh, and that's where the human, humanities comes in. And it's interesting that, that the humanists are starting to have an interesting impact uh, on, uh, on, um, on the sciences, uh, to the extent you consider medicine, for example, a science, uh, recent uh, uh, deliberations have concluded that the admission standards for admission to medical school ought to be, ought to be mitigated uh, and, uh, and that let the medical schools teach, teach the science and teach the medicine and bring in students with social science and humanities backgrounds because they're going to make better physicians. They're going to mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, um, uh, um, reach out to patients in a, in a, in a more concerned and, uh, and humanistic way. Uh, it never occurred to me uh, uh, that that was the function of physicians until I started getting older and sicker. Uh, 
it always seemed to me that the, the function of physicians, at least the, the people I went to college with, all wanted to become research med uh, physicians. They all wanted to teach at medical schools. And many of them went on not only to get the MD degree, but the PhDs as well. Andy? And I think this is uh, particularly germane when you look at how we process an issue like global climate change. Because certainly you see it um, affecting us not in a purely research sense, but in a cultural sense, in a social sense, in a political sense, in a religious sense. Well, yeah, and, and by the thing that I always see conflated, and the biggest, the biggest source of arguments on an issue like global warming is, is the conflation of the is, this is the David Hume, the is and the ought. Um, and, and Dan, I think you've written about this stuff. Um, Essentially, science lays out the is. This is the landscape, including the uncertainties about sea, sea ice, species loss, you know, how much warming you could have. But science has a hard time telling you what to do. Um, and there's been this argument, well, the scientist has to be treated like the physician telling you, you know, take it to aspirin. And, and, but there's a, there's a problem there because not every scientist is in the, the role of policy. And so how do, you, how do you, one of the best ways to disarm an argument over global warming is to start by dissecting the question. You know, how dangerous is global warming? This is this classic question. That's not a science question. The pace of sea level rise is, is determines the, the disruption from, and on, to coasts of, of, from global warming. But that, you know, how, how much investment in technology to, to, to ameliorate those impacts versus working on the emissions mitigation versus uh, solution nuclear power versus uh, renewables versus uh, nat is natural gas a valid bridge? Those, Science only gives you a certain chunk of that, and, and if you don't get comfortable with the, the reality that the other part of it is values-based, right. and that comes from your humanistic background, then, then you're in trouble. A lot of, lot of deadlock. I, I also think one of the things that's changing now is, again, when, when I was coming up, uh, the, the notion was the scientist in his laboratory alone. Increasingly now, there's an emphasis on collaboration. Collaboration not only between students and universities, which are now linking uh, programs and classes and, uh, and, and uh, research, but also collaboration between the, what goes on in the university, what goes on in the government, what goes on in, in uh, industry, and uh, an increasing need to fund things through bringing uh, resources together from multiple sources. Uh, there simply isn't enough money in the universities to do the kinds of things on their own that they used to do. One of the things I've always thought contributed to this is that the, the culture of science does not reward scientists for engaging in the conversation outside their own community. Um, there's not very many um, significant career boosts you get for being a good communicator. There's not very many scientific societies that reward you for having a conversation with the public. And I think that that also is something that I would like to, I would like to see universities in a way that they haven't done, spearhead that change in acknowledging that if less scientists are willing to get out there and share what they do, we're never going to take this yeah. conversation to its successful conclusion. It, go, it goes beyond the university. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Science Foundation ostensibly yeah. has a requirement for every grant. Of, of greater outcomes, broader outcomes is the language, which often is translated into pub public output. Right. But it's usually a kind of a rubber stampy sort of by the way aspect. So if the funders got more serious about that becoming a normal obligation, uh, not so much of the individual scientists, but of the institution, yes. then you'd see a lot more of what you're talking about. It's not only the scientists though, it's all professions which are celebrated by their own. There's, <coughs> there's lawyers and there are civilians. There are there are scientists and there are civilians. There are historians and there are civilians. And, and so somebody gets to be a professor of history, he or she wants to be celebrated by the American Historical Association. They don't, wanna, they don't care as much once they've got tenure and full professorship about their, about their own institution. Uh, they, they become uh, uh, cosmopolitans and the people who concern with the campus are thought of as provincials. Uh, and, and, that, and that has a negative effect on the community of the campus and, and the welfare of the institution. People jump around. I mean, if you're a professor at, uh, at, uh, at, at GW and you get a better offer at Harvard, you're gone. Um, I'm not so sure it works the other way uh, consistently. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, fa the, fact that, the fact of the matter is that, that, uh, that knitting universities together and having them have some sense of the future of universities, which is one of the issues we're addressing today, 
is very hard to insinuate into the faculty ranks because they've been brought up as physicists or they've been brought up as, as uh, historians. Well, you know, I do think, but there is some, um, again, in getting around and also getting around virtually, um, I get the impression that there's motivation on young faculty to start sort of uh, working around the system. Um, the end of the textbook is leading to great opportunities to build online learning tools that will be much richer if they're collaboratively managed. Uh, you know, I can create, and there's so much parallel evolution going on in different campuses. ASU has a great sustainability program. Um, Brent Salier is doing this remarkable work on innovation. Um, but finding ways to um, create a common, more wiki style um, learning enterprise, the, the successor to a textbook on these issues that we bundle as sustainability, is something that can be done by right now. Uh, Duke University, uh, I was there recently, a marine, a marine science professor with some students doing the software, prog the programming created an iPad app that's a, basically an introductory text on big, big cool marine animals. And it's a freshman course. And uh, it could be a chapter in a much bigger open enterprise that takes you through biology, climate, um, earth science. Uh, we just have, it takes motivation and sort of intentionality. And it also takes breaking down those barriers of who owns the idea, who, 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 who authored the textbook. Sure. Building a community enterprise like that is possible now in a way that, also it's cheap. It's, it's ridiculously cheap to do that. Um, so we have the tools. Well, and I think part of it is, is that people, it turns out, like plants are, are tropistic, except it's not so much the sun and water, it's, it's, uh, it's money. And so <laughs> you talk about motivation. If you, if you want to motivate people, if you put money on the table, not everybody, of course, uh, but, but frequently, people are very responsive. And, and if you reward professors uh, who turn out to be Americans like everybody else, uh, if you reward them for doing certain things, they'll do those things. And if you reward them for doing the other things, they'll do the other things. And part of what's happened is, oh, I guess since the end of the Second World War to today, we've been rewarding faculty for, uh, for uh, research and for publications. And, and, and frankly, counting them as much as we have been reading them. And, so, and, so, uh, uh, and then promoting people and, and, and giving them raises dependent on their quote-unquote productivity. We have about... Ten minutes or so left, is that right, Dan? No? Or are we out of time? The, uh, the time factor seems to have the room. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, and, and I have always have more questions, but if there was anyone at this moment, why don't we open it up uh, here and then back here. Yes, go. Hi. Uh, I just was wondering, you haven't really spoken very much about the role of STEM. You haven't spoken. Okay, you haven't spoken very much about uh, the, the role of the research university in the world. I mean, you, we've even talked about the professors being Americans, yep. and that may be true, but so many of the students now at the higher levels are from all over the world, and in a sense, we're invested. There's an increasing tension between the fact that we are investing in what is a world venture. Could you identify yourself? Uh, I'm Lisa Marganelli. I'm with the New America Foundation. Yes, that's, well. cer that's, cer that's, certainly, that's certainly true and, and, uh, and, a, and a source of concern, particularly in the, in the states where state universities are funded by taxpayer money and they, and they notice that a great many of the graduate students uh, are from abroad and, and frequently complain that their children, the children of the taxpayers, can't understand uh, uh, the, uh, the instruction that they're receiving uh, in the classes. And I, I can tell you that my own son had this experience at Yale so it's not merely the, taxpayer, the taxpayers, it's the tuition payers. Um, I think we have some obligation uh, uh, as, as the United States to, uh, to have done this. Uh, increasingly, I think China and India uh, and, uh, and Korea are going to have to step up. And we're seeing them building uh, universities uh, hand over fist over hand. Uh, you, tr you travel abroad and, uh, and you... you there was one building there this year, and you come back two years later, and they've got a whole campus. Um, and many of these people are going back to their countries and building these universities. So I think you're going to see increasing uh, interaction and, and the uh, uh, capacity for electronic uh, uh, collaboration is increasingly uh, uh, going to result in, in people doing teaching together. I mean, two classes uh, studying a single subject in, in the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, now Russia, and in the United States. Uh, uh, can meet concurrently uh, to discuss uh, peace or, uh, or any issue you want. And, and, uh, and similarly, scientists are doing work together. 
Um, I've got faculty at, uh, at uh, I gotta stop doing that. I used to be president there, I'm not. I used to have faculty, I, now I have colleagues. That's what I have. Uh, uh, <coughs> who, uh, who, who do work with, uh, with scientists abroad all the, all the time, and on the phone constantly, and, uh, and, um, and I think you're gonna see more of that, and, uh, and you're gonna see more of that funded by international companies uh, as well. Just, just very quickly, um, you know, I've written increasingly about what I call noosphere. Uh, it's building on the, the, the Greek word noosphere, planet of the mind, from a long time ago. But basically, uh, I'll give you one example. In, in Johannesburg, there was a riot that actually people died in a riot outside a university because the students couldn't get in. Uh, there were students who couldn't fit in. And um, I said, you know, what an opportunity given the telecommunications revolution that's underway. You know, seven billion, six billion cell phones on the planet right now, let, and increasing you know, internet act uh, connectedness, even in faraway places, to dive in and offer that free portal. This is not the research and so much as the basic university education. You can't build schools fast enough in developing countries right now, whether they're universities or, or lower down the chain. So finding ways to, to jump, to leapfrog that, the lack of, of bricks and mortar is, is really essential right now and I, doable. I'm, I'm on the advisory board now of a university called the People's University, uh, and notwithstanding that sort of, uh, strange name. Um, it, is a, it is an effort to deliver uh, undergraduate education to uh, people in third world countries who have an ability to get to a computer and speak enough English to get courses that are transmitted for free. Uh, sponsored by a, uh, an Israeli uh, entrepreneur by the name of Shai Rashif, who uh, made a lot of money and is trying to give back in this, uh, in this way. So uh, I, th I think you're going to see uh, just a, a great revolution uh, planetary revolution as a result of the uh, capacity to communicate now. Back here. Hi, my name is Susie Kim. I'm a reporter from the Washington Post. Um, I wanted to go back to a comment that Dan Sarowitz had made at the beginning, which is that um, in terms of investments and, and the changes that need to be made, it's not just a question of, of funding, and, and I guess specifically government funding that he pointed to. I was wondering if you could give me some specific examples of what the role of government could be, what it, what it should be, um, I guess, since we're talking about universities, in, in terms of creating this um, knowledge enterprise architecture, what we need to make innovation happen, if it beyond just dollars for, for R&D. I'd love to jump on that briefly. Um, I recently wrote a piece after I went to Rensselaer about this young innovator who created this business, growing mar mush mushrooms, turning them into packaging material, even bare. And then Andy Hargaden, uh, who basically studies the ecology of innovation, he's at UC Davis, wrote me a long, interesting comment that became another post about one of the first steps to, again, like what I said about the dangers of global warming, deconstruct the issue. It's, it's not just basic science, but as, as Andy Hargaden says, there's two kinds of networks you build to, to, to make progress in this world. One is idea networks, and one is action networks. So making sure that if you have a finite pool of money to invest in this pipeline that we call the human journey, make sure you, you absolutely need all that, all that bubbling, random, almost random science at the beginning. But then you need to, to have the capacity to turn that into action. And this goes back to the invention of the steam engine. Hargaden did a paper on uh, some com impediments were not around for, uh, what's his name? <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, uh, what, right? <laughs> Uh, and it took 10 more years than it might have to take us into the coal age and create global warming. <laughs> just, just, you don't have to carry that far to, to have the innovation of the steam engine. That's a good point. Did yeah. you want to also address no, that? Take care of that? Okay, back here. And then I'll, um, then I'll move over to this side. Sorry, guys. Uh, Ken Jarbo, Athena Alliance. Could you comment briefly on what's happening in terms of the erosion of public support for higher education in general? This notion that higher education only pays off for the graduate, a la George Will's comment column a, a little while ago, and that there's no, no taxpayer benefit to ed having an educated public. Yes, well, I think that's a serious issue, and I think there's going to be a, a, a need uh, for further, uh, further debate. Uh, we see it being played out in many agendas uh, in, this country, uh, in this country today um, about whether the state uh, is the beneficiary of an educated populace or, uh, or uh, whether the individual is the beneficiary of what he or she receives. Um, and it was James Madison uh, who said, uh, education is the true foundation of civil liberty. 
I know this because it was engraved over the uh, threshold of my school, uh, James Madison High School in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, and I saw it every day for four years. Uh, but it, uh, it seems to me to have some merit. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I think unless we are uh, uh, true to the founders uh, on at least uh, uh, the issue of education, um, uh, we're going to find ourselves in desperate, uh, in desperate position, uh, both um, uh, economically and, and culturally. Um, John Gardner, uh, the old uh, uh, former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, once said in a, uh, in a speech that the society which uh, only celebrated uh, uh, philosophers and, and denigrated plumbers was a society in which neither the pipes nor the ideas would hold water. Um, I, I think that goes both ways, and, and uh, our society benefits, obviously, I think, uh, almost uh, self-explanatory uh, self by, uh, by the um, uh, uh, education of, of our population. We needed to maintain a, a civic environment. Uh, we needed to be able to vote. We needed to be able to, um, uh, to drive the economy. And, uh, and we, we see uh, that um, education is rewarded, both in the individual and in society, by the earning trajectories of people who have uh, education as opposed to those who don't. And those who don't are supported by, uh, by welfare and by the others who do. Uh, and, uh, and it seems to me also that to have a large, uneducated population uh, in a society like our own uh, is to invite revolution. Did you want uh, to? Let's save time. There's, there's plenty to say. Over here? Let's save time. You first. You go okay. okay. Uh, uh, Robert Huey, REH Kinetics. Um, there are several comments that have been made that seem to be in a way interrelated. One, the amount of time available at the university. You have four months that you're not doing anything, and Fridays, et cetera. Yes. Two, the conflict or the tension between research and instruction. And three, the problem with people not understanding what research or science is, or actually what knowledge creation is. And together, it seems to suggest that what should be required is that for a real university, any student must be required to be a knowledge creator. That it needs to spend a significant fraction of the time, or some fraction of their time, doing research or research in humanities, science, whatever area it is. That should be a key component. Move away from just this linear transmission of knowledge, but rather make creation of knowledge a key component. That's a nice model. I, I, I'm not sure it's for everybody. I, you know, people are always saying to me, uh, you know, I've got this kid and I'm trying to figure out where to send him to school or send her to school, and, and uh, what's the best school? And I say, there's no such thing as the best school any more than there's the best suit. Uh, first of all, we don't all wear size 42 regular. Secondly, in, uh, in August in Washington, you want, uh, you want linen or seersucker, and, uh, and, uh, and in uh, January, you want uh, flannel or you want tweed. Uh, there are different schools, different needs, different curriculum. That's why there are 4,400 4, colleges in the United States. We serve a variety of people in a variety of different ways. Um, but I like, I like your model for some, for some students, and indeed, uh, whether we like it or not, there are always going to be smarter kids and more elite kids and kids who are going to go on to lives of academic accomplishment for who need a, 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 a training and a trajectory that's distinguishable from people who are going to hold jobs. Uh, which are useful and, and, and uh, sustain society, but which call for less challenging uh, educational experiences. Just, just, you know, there's a perfect template for what I see as the ideal learning hub. It, it, it's a high school. It's the, the New York Harbor School. And if you just Google for that and go to their website, it's a, it's a public school that takes students 80% uh, below the poverty rate. It takes students from across the city. Uh, they go out to Governor's Island, and they, the whole curriculum is built around New York Harbor. But there's something there for everyone. The kids who are maybe not as adept at chemistry aren't doing water chemistry. They're building boats. And they're using the boats to build oyster reefs in the harbor to try to restore water quality and understand the harbor ecosystem. So the school is built around its subject. And it's, it's, but the subject is the region. And it's incredibly rich. Uh, the kids who come out of there are going to the best colleges in America. I, I'm unbelievably thrilled with the kids that I met there. So, 
think about that at the high school level, I mean, at the college level, and you can see some interesting things coming. Until the last couple of questions, most of the discussion has been in terms of kind of a generic research university. Do we need a better way of disaggregating our universities in Carnegie's research one, two, and three? Does such exist and would be useful? Oh, James Sang, retired. And that'll be the last question because we're almost out of time. Do one of you want to tackle? Uh, Yes, I, I mean, yes, I think that's, that's a reasonable question, and one, I haven't thought about it, and, uh, and I didn't come in with an answer for it, but I can imagine uh, um, uh, recategorizing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the universities in, uh, in, uh, finer, in finer ways uh, that would be more useful to, uh, quote unquote, the consumers of, uh, of, uh, of education, and also the work that goes on in universities. There are, in fact, faculty who really love to teach and don't want to be in laboratories and don't want to be writing books. And, uh, and, uh, and there are others who would just as be happy in, their, in a laboratory and they, you don't bother them with students, they're delighted. And, uh, and nobody, uh, nobody thinks that All Souls College is a terrible place at Oxford because they don't, de they don't deal with students. Uh, it, it, we, need, we need the seersucker suits and we need the tweed suits and, uh, and uh, and fortunately in this country, we're blessed with a wide variety and assortment of different choices. And so on that optimistic note, we're going to close this panel.